<laughs> Hello everyone, uh, my name is Wing Ting, I'm from Google, and uh, I will talk about uh, collaboration in the cloud at Google. Here is a talk. So um, this talk is meant to invite uh, hypothesis, new thoughts about computer-aided collaboration in the cloud. And my colleague Makoto Vuchida is also coming here. Uh, welcome to come to our poster session. Uh, comments and complaints are welcomed. Um, this study is aimed to show how the Google Doc Suite is used for collaboration at Google and how it has changed over time via visualization of activities on Docs and analysis of evolution of Google's collaboration network. Potentially, this study can be extended to other enterprises as well. This shows life of an engineering design docs. X-axis is time in hours, and each user action type is assigned unique color. Collaborators were located in London and Mountain View with a nine hour time zone difference. One team was writing the design doc, and the other is reviewing it. This figure shows the life of the interview doc. Each user is assigned a unique color. During the interview, the engineer was able to watch the candidate which is in red, writing code. Collaborative editing allows the coding interview to take place remotely. This is a, a figure for a life of a global document. Each location is assigned a unique color for each action type. Employees working from nine locations in eight countries across the globe contributed to this document. It was either viewed or edited with gaps of less than 12 hours. This video frame shows the history of events on a single document, which is viewed and edited by multiple users from many locations. Each continent from which users work is assigned a different color. View actions are represented as circles, and edit actions are represented as dots. Here, this graph shows the average number of active users working in Google Docs in each day of week and time of day slot. X axis is day of week and Y axis is time of day in local time. We can see that laptop desktop usage peaks during working hours, while mobile phone usage peaks at out of office hours. The percentage of new employees with at least three collaborators increased from 35% in January 2011, the bottom red curve, to 70% in March 2013, the top blue curve, a doubling over the last two years. Uh, these are snapshots of one month's collaboration network at Google. Uh, the red dots represent employees in engineering, and blue dots represent employees in sales and marketing. So we can see that both within and across organization collaboration has increased over time. Last but not least, the default sharing on doc is private sharing. However, we find that the percentage of publicly shared documents has increased about 12%, from 48% to 54% in the last year. In that sense, the culture of sharing is changing from private sharing to public sharing. Thanks for listening. Okay, 40 seconds are long. So my name is, <laughs> my name is Thomas Rissel. I'm coming from L3S Research Center in Hanover, and I'm presenting a poster about, um, <laughs> I have to work on my magic, I think, <laughs> about uh, the a study that we conducted on, on Wikipedia about the evolution of entities. And it's still not coming. <laughs> Yes, there it is. So that's a study that we conducted on Wikipedia about the evolution of, of names of, of named entities. And uh, you probably know that, that uh, things like the Internet or St. Petersburg have previously different names. And that is something we're interested in uh, to, to figure out for, for, to improve search on, on, on large-scale um, archives. And so you see these are examples that you know, but there are maybe other examples like the city of Plovdiv in Bulgaria that you never know where, which 
previous names they had. The reasons for this are political changes or language evolutions, which is currently, with the current content, not a big issue because you're anyway not looking so much on, on the past content. But when you move, want to look into archives, it is an issue because when you look there, for example, for St. Petersburg, then you have only the results that's from 1700 to, to 1914 and from 1991 onwards. In the middle, there's a lot of documents are missing about it. You can address this by adding uh, pseudonyms to the query, but you have to know about them. That is easy for St. Petersburg, but uh, for other places, not so easy. So how do we find these names? And we think that Wikipedia is a, is a good place to, to find this information. So that's why we have done this, this analysis. And we want to see there how, wiki, how evolutions of named entities are handled in Wikipedia. And how can we find this uh, um, uh, information within Wikipedia? Um, Wikipedia itself, uh, and every document has, a, has to show the, uh, the current name of an entity. If the na in name is changing, then um, the title has to change and redirect of the former name has to be given. Um, but it's not always the case. As you see from New Amsterdam and New York City, there are unfortunately not, no redirect between them. But they have, fortunately, also uh, uh, list pages where they list all these changes. Unfortunately, not all, but uh, especially for geographic names and products. But there's date information missing, and uh, the kinds of description are very different. So we were looking then, then deeper into to this and figured out from, from these pages that 98% uh, of the entities mentioned on these pages have also uh, articles in, in, in Wikipedia. And of those, uh, more than one third have also, where these articles also annotate with date information when this change happened. And we also analyzed further um, that um, that most of these information are, are described within one sentence, but some of them required up to eight, nine sentences to, to, to bring all this information together in the article, which is then interesting to know, to, uh, to learn, maybe classify on this, to extract from, from also from other documents uh, this information. That's actually the aim that we have here, to use what, what we have now as a, as a ground truth to train classifiers and extend this approach and also to other sources, to other languages and so on. And finally, to answer the question of plot lifts, they have 11 changes in, in their history according to Wikipedia, so that's a lot. It's hard to remember, I think. And if you want to know more about this, then you should come to the poster that comes next on the next slide here. Okay, thank you. So now I have my 40 seconds. <laughs> okay, so my name is Judith Barilan. I'm from, uh, from Israel, and our poster that we'll see in a minute is also about Wikipedia. It's about Wikipedia research in, uh, over, over the years. Okay, and this is joint work with Noah Aroni. She's also from the Department of Information Science at Bar Ilan University in Israel. So as you may all know, Wikipedia was launched in 2001, and research in, on Wikipedia started in 2002. There are many reasons to study Wikipedia. It's a collaborative effort. It uh, has a huge data corpus. And in several languages, links between different language versions. And it's also the source of DBpedia, which is at the core of the linked open data. So we collected data at the end of 2013 using Elsevier Scopus, we searched for Wikipedia in the title, abstract, and keywords, and were able to collect more than 3,500 records. We were thinking about using other data sources, but uh, we settled with Scopus. And here I show the overall growth over the years from three different data sources, the ASM Digital Library, Web of Science, and Scopus. What's interesting to see is that the growth, is, it seem, growth seems to be level off. I didn't do anything. <laughs> oh, did, OK. <laughs> This is what you have to do. It has no seems to level off over time. 
and <laughs> okay. So we did a content analysis of the data. We there were some unrelated documents just mentioning Wikipedia, but not doing any study of that. These were removed, and we, interesting to see topic about Wikipedia, studying Wikipedia, and or using Wikipedia as a resource. And we see the topic change over time. Started out, of course, with studying Wikipedia itself, and around 2005, started to use Wikipedia as a resource for other research, like data mining and stuff like that. And we, the next slide is about the approach. Uh, with a social approach or a technological approach. And here we see already that in t around 2006, the technological uh, approach overtook uh, the social approach, and it's still leading. So more technological studies are being conducted. And this is well reflected in on the document type. As you can see, the most uh, popular document type was conference papers, even though Scopus doesn't have a, an excellent coverage of, of uh, conference papers. And then we also looked at citation distribution. There's nothing unexpected here. There are very few highly cited documents with lots of documents cited only once. And the ones that are not cited at all are not represented here. This is on a log log scale. And uh, the, if you're interested, the most uh, highly cited article is uh, uh, encyclopedias come, go head, head to head. That's comparison of the uh, Britannica with Wikipedia. And if you want to learn more about this, you're most welcome to visit our poster. Well, thank you. Hello, uh, my name's Eamon Walls, and I'm a PhD student at Southampton. Uh, our poster grew out of a collaboration that happened at China in December 2013. A group of students from Tsinghua came to Southampton, and then a group of us went to China. And um, the Chinese students, of course, spoke perfect English, and uh, I don't speak a word of Chinese. But um, the project was uh, based on the Web Observatory, and we were given a data set by Tsinghua University. And um, so, so these are my collaborators. And uh, the paper is basically describing the challenges and opportunities that we faced in, during these two weeks. Uh, we use this data set to create some visualizations, which are hosted at the Southampton Web Observatory. But um, we, so these are our collaborators at Tsinghua University, KAIST in Korea, and also uh, NUS in Singapore. We, uh, we found three main types of challenges, uh, legal, technical, and organizational. Whenever we got this data set, we didn't know where it came from. And unfortunately, the, uh, the researchers at Tsinghua also didn't know where it came from because they had got it from someone else, some of their colleagues. And it was only a couple of months later that we found out that uh, there was a paper written by Tsinghua researchers, and they had used this data set. And so provenance was a real problem for us that um, from a professional point of view, it's difficult for us to publish if we don't know where this data has even come from. Um, so uh, we've heard a little bit about the Web Observatory before um, Professor Hall was talking about this notion of creating an environment where we can share data and make it as easy as possible to analyze and visualize. We were using data from Sinaway Boa and we found that one of the challenges was technical. That was, that was perhaps the primary challenge that we found. In our team, we had some students who are very, very technically competent and also fluent in several languages, mainly the Chinese students, right? Um, in my case, I'm not technically competent. I have a philosophy background. And when we were doing this, uh, we had to use technologies like JSON files, MongoDB. Uh, we were writing Python scripts to parse the data set. And all of this requires quite a high level of technical competence. These were our search terms, um, which were decided in collaboration with the professors. This is just a description of our process that we used. The, the parser was done using Python. 
Um, another challenge that we found was um, whenever we were writing up, we were trying to describe how to interpret this data. In what ways can you, to, to what extent can you make claims about the meaning of this? Because it's very nice to create a visualization, but then what does the visualization actually mean? And this was a real tension that grew between the sociologists and the computer scientists and the team. Um, so just to summarize, um, for the future of the web observatory, we felt that one of the most important um, issues to consider is the incentive that these institutions might have to share data. If we have Tsinghua University and Kaist in Korea and Southampton, and they've all got this data, and that's great. And yes, it would be great if they all shared the data, but what's the incentive for doing so? Um, so just some acknowledgments on my references, and thank you very much. I guess I wait a bit or <laughs> okay I'll uh, use a few minutes uh, before it starts to just introduce um, myself so hello again I am Asma Lashteka and I'm going to be presenting a um, poster work by colleagues from the L3S Research Center who uh, didn't come uh, so I get the privilege to present uh, another work um, okay. okay, perfect. So the uh, topic of the presentation is analyzing the duration of trending topics in Twitter using uh, Wikipedia. Um, so in this work, the authors are trying to um, understand uh, or give insights about trending topics in uh, Twitter, but using um, external sources. So their basic observation is that when you look into trending hashtags or topics in general in Twitter, there are mixed endogenous and exogenous topics. Endogenous like Follow Friday, and then others like Super Bowl that are actually happening in the real world. And their main motivation is how can we tell apart between this? And they hypothesize that things that are happening outside should be heard outside of this platform as well. So that is, uh, if something is trending in Twitter, it should also be trending across the web in, in different sources. Um, in this particular work, they use Wikipedia as the external source. Um, and you might be uh, asking, well, Twitter, real time, Wikipedia, and uh, online encyclopedia, how do they match? And uh, they leverage uh, key insights from uh, pr uh, recent studies that there is only a mere three hours difference between these uh, uh, platforms, really, about, uh, uh, to track about what's uh, happening um, in the real world. Here we see an example, for, uh, uh, let's say, uh, on a timeline of, uh, on the top uh, plot, a hashtag timeline Super Bowl. If we look into the uh, edit timelines of Wikipedia, we see pages that contain players, and then uh, same way the Wikipedia view uh, timelines give us views of uh, players relating to that event. What's even more remarkable for um, topics that last longer uh, there is even uh, barely any difference between the timelines that y you see on Twitter and, and on Wikipedia, which means that by aligning this time component, you can actually track what's uh, trending uh, on, uh, on the real world. This is the overall uh, framework they follow. So basically, the task is to try to predict duration of uh, uh, topics that will be trending. So they start with a corpus of tweets. They take what's trending in a given time window. They uh, say they select the top trending uh, topics, and then they collect the tweets that contain uh, these mentions. And then they use off-the-shelf uh, um, entity recognition and linking tools to uh, get the page uh, uh, that mention uh, these kind of tweets on Wikipedia. After linking these tweets with the Wikipedia articles, they generate features, uh, and then they do this uh, uh, classification task. Well, they show that uh, just by using uh, the baseline without using any features uh, except Wikipedia, just by incorporating Wikipedia features, they beat the baseline, which is to say that uh, incorporating Wikipedia edit and view uh, the statistics as features will, oh, will, uh, will predict uh, the duration of trending topics uh, very well. 
uh, that's the uh, main uh, takeaway message. So we can try to uh, get the main uh, uh, trending topics in, in a given platform uh, by using uh, Wikipedia as an external source. And this uh, whole project was done in the framework of two projects, Forget It and Kubrick, which are under the FP7 uh, framework. Thank you. If you need more information, uh, we have the poster session, and I will try to uh, uh, pass the word uh, there. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kazuto Shizahara. Uh, I'm from uh, Nagoya University, uh, Japan. Before the first slide, I'd like to briefly introduce my uh, poster. So, previous studies have shown that, uh, previous street analysis shown that the collective mood swings daily and weekly by analyzing street text. But this study, I'll focus on uh, emoticons, Japanese emoticons. So that the, my uh, title of the poster presentation is Quantifying collective mood by emoticon networks, I define uh, how to construct emoticon networks in the later slides. So the previous studies have shown that tweet analysis demonstrated so uh, collective mood swings daily and weekly, like this, by analyzing uh, linguistic information. So the similar patterns were found also that the other uh, uh, groups. The mo target of this study is collective, online collective mood linked with real life events. Uh, to explore this uh, collective mood, I'll construct emoticon networks by focusing on the information flows among uh, Japanese emoticons and emotional adjectives in Japanese. To obtain the three data set, User timelines were collected by snowball sampling, like this, using Twitter REST API. And as a result, uh, I got a large data set of tweets that covers 2010 and 2011. So emoticon networks I propose consist of nodes and rings. Nodes represent Japanese emoticons like these, and emoticon adjectives and directed links represent information flows among Japanese emoticons and adjectives, which, were, which was characterized by effective transfer entropy. First, I checked the frequency distribution of emoticons and kanji characters. The resulting plot showed a highly skewed distribution, and positive emoticons are on the high rank, and most of which are related to positive, but slightly different emotions. So these graphs show that three series before and after Japan earthquake. And as you see here, uh, after the earthquake, most emoticons drastically decrease except crying emoticon. And similarly, while negative ones increase, positive adjectives, uh, ad adjectives decreased. So this is the, uh, I construct emoticon network by using these data. And the left network more, uh, showed more uh, connected with the understandable patterns, the left one, right one shows that more isolated with a strange closed loop. Summary. So we propose emoticon networks as a tool for exploring collective mood in online social media. And then we applied our method to demonstrate the dynamics of collective mood before and after Japan earthquake. These are the follows. In future works, I need more analysis, of course, and validation, comparison with other methods. And in my poster presentation, uh, I'll give you uh, the details of this study with a uh, uh, couple of uh, other e examples. So please come to my poster and let's discuss. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, I am uh, uh, Spiros, uh, my assistant prof professor at uh, Rutgers University, um, and recently also a 3D printing addict. Um, and I'm hoping some of this enthusiasm will uh, rub off here. Just curious, how many people have seen a 3D printer? Have a 3D printer? 
One, two, oh, wow, great. Um, so actually, um, confession, let's get that out of the way first. I have two, one that I bought and one that I built uh, myself at home. Um, but there are technologies, there are various technologies that go up to the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but basically, all of these are rapid prototyping devices that take a digital file that describes a physical object and give it physical substance. Um, these have been around for several decades, but thanks to the magic of online sharing and to open development, you've probably just heard about them in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, some examples of designs that I've made and I've published on the web so that other people can download them and print them or make them or also download them and modify them or remix them or both as well as designs that I've downloaded and printed myself including another printer. Now you might say, well wait a minute, isn't that a complicated device, right? How did you do that? Actually I live in an apartment and it turns out that you can Google it, download the files, uh, tweak them or remix them as necessary to suit your needs and then feed them to the printer, give them physical substance, and assemble. Of course, there's still skill required, um, but this dramatically lowers the barriers of doing things like this, um, largely because of the technology and largely even more because uh, all of this thing happens online with sharing. So one of the main points here and the thing I want to introduce is that things, physical objects, are now really part of the web. Um, they are a form of digital content, and as you'll see, this is rapidly growing, right? Um, it's small still, kind of like 15 years ago, but rapidly growing. Um, the most, by far the most popular, I guess here is true that there can be only one repository for publishing and sharing physical object designs is called Thingiverse, um, owned by MakerBot. Um, if you drop by the poster, I'll be happy to give you more details on this. Um, so that's where we collected um, our data from. Um, last year it was about 40,000 physical things, but now it's about tripled. Um, if you look at the growth rate, it's doubling every six months. And if you look at things that are remixes, basically not new, uh, but taking someone else's design and modifying it or repurposing it, that grows at about every four months. Uh, so, th so there's a very active remixing sharing community. Um, so we can collect various metrics, for example, with respect to various measures of popularity and see um, how they relate uh, to each other, as well as how they relate to the user effort required to take these actions, as well as um, design complexity. Again, um, please drop by the poster if you want to learn more. Um, of course, um, this is a real network, so we do find a number of sublinear relationships or power laws. For example, with respect to user actions similar to other domains, as well as a number of other power laws with respect to the structure of the graph um, or various aspects that can be modeled as a graph, which I will be happy to discuss in the poster. And another last thing I want to point out, we can make some initial quantification in the difference between what makes a thing uh, popular, as in people want to download it and print it and make it, versus generative. They find it as inspiration to take it and instead of printing it, modifying it and turning it into something else and possibly uh, resharing this. Um, so please come to the poster if you want to hear about these things. Um, as long as other ongoing work. Um, there is also an interactive visualization of this emerging web um, that I'll have at the poster, or you can uh, browse at this URL. And as a side bonus, I'll have some examples of this web turned physical from my printer. Um, unfortunately, the printer was a bit of a challenge for TSA. I stole this from my daughter. There'll be more. Thank you. My name is Ben Shabdalai. I'm a PhD student at the University of Louisville and uh, from the Knowledge Discovery and uh, Web Mining Lab. So I'm going to um, present one of our research, which is uh, about a solution to the Colossart problem, which is the one of the common problems of the uh, collaborative filtering recommender systems. Uh, yeah, here you can see the title and um, Mm, that's the poster I'm going to present. Uh, so yeah, what are recommender systems? There are among the web personalization applications that are used to suggest items uh, to the users based, uh, based on the user's interest and uh, his past activities and history that we have from the um, user. So whether these interests are implicit or explicit.
Yeah, there are multiple type of recommender systems. So uh, some of them are content-based. Um, other types are uh, collaborative filtering, which is based on the ratings and uh, the similarity between the user that we have. So basically the input that we are using um, are the ratings, like whether a user has liked or disliked or has given a rate. So here is an example from the Netflix. Uh, the ratings you can see are in the form of stars from one to five. However, uh, these type of systems have um, uh, some issues. One of them is called the start. Uh, we don't have um, enough ratings for all the users and uh, from all the users and uh, and not um, users. I mean, um, they don't rate enough items. So um, there's this sparse data set that we have. Uh, one common uh, methods that are used uh, for collaborative filtering is using non-negative matrix factorization. Basically, what it does, it takes the um, input matrix and decompose it into two um, components. So it's like uh, taking uh, the users and the items and uh, take them into a latent space. Uh, however, this method does not work uh, when uh, there is called a survey and we don't have enough ratings. And it requires at least to have some ratings for the items and users. Uh, so one approach is to use other um, domains uh, rather than ratings, uh, like so we can use hybrid approaches. Um, in the asymmetric NMF, we can take a um, new domain, like, like in the, form, in the uh, example of movie recommendation, we can have the genre uh, domain and the, as the first domain. So we take our um, uh, components, and uh, in the latent space, now we have movie and the genre. So we can take movie and take it to the uh, second domain and use it uh, in the second domain. Uh, we answered uh, two questions. So what is the effect of adding the genre domain or the, se um, or the second domain? And how does it handle the new item called the start? Uh, we used movie lens data set from the group lens project, which has 1,700 movies. Um, here are the results shown in the form of um, errors, mean squared error. And uh, we can see that uh, for the color set, we have very low error. And the red one is uh, our uh, asymmetric NMF, which is uh, a lot, uh, I mean, better than the classical NMF. And um, an example is also showed in the form of top five recommended uh, movies. Uh, it's, it, uh, it shows we ha uh, our results has a um, very good overlap with the uh, rating the, uh, data from the training that uh, was used in the test. Uh, yes. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes? OK. Uh, my name is Gopi. Uh, I work at the same lab as Benush. Uh, we kind of like work on a much bigger problem. Uh, imagine uh, the huge screen that you saw in the, uh, the Dark Knight movie where Morgan Freeman would look at. And then it shows different things, like uh, the current things happening. So that's kind of like what we are trying to build. Uh, but it's based on Twitter. So you kind of like track tweets, and then we try to build systems like that. So uh, to build those systems, we try to, uh, this is kind of like a part of a much bigger project. Uh, we try to use the sentiments and then to see uh, different topics so that we can concentrate on specific sent uh, type of sentiment for specific topics. Uh, so these are the motivations that we have. Uh, so we have uh, millions and millions of tweets that are being generated every day. Uh, uh, right now, we are going to talk about a sample, uh, June, to, uh, June from last year to this year. And then we were using uh, topic modeling with LDA and JSD. So uh, our objective is to, uh, to create a scalable detection of sentiment-aware topic from Twitter streams. That's the system that we are trying to build. And we are going to use the online LDA and JST to create a new approach uh, which would uh, extract topics on the fly, uh, extract sentiments, and then uh, show you the topics. Um, this is an online LDA. Uh, I'm sure most of you might be aware of this. Uh, it just tries to uh, extract topics from a set of text documents, and it tries to associate words to topics, and then documents to topics. topics. So uh, you can see which documents are part of each topics. It's a proportional thing. Uh, this is the JST. Uh, this is the player diagram. The JST introduces a new variable, the sentiment S that you can see here. 
uh, at theta and pi. So it's, it kind of like adds a new dimension to the whole topic modeling. So it's kind of like an extra dimension and then an extra proportions. So this is the online JST thing that we have proposed. Uh, it's kind of like uh, a hybrid of online LDA and uh, JST. Uh, the, pretty much the objective function on everything is the same. Uh, we need to uh, maximize the equation that you see there. Uh, this is the algorithm for it. So as you can see, t uh, for each tweet, so t equal to zero to infinite. So it means that you pretty much take the tweet as it comes in, and then you just uh, add it to the topic model, and then it kind of like uh, creates a new set of topics and everything like that. Okay. Uh, so the, the hardest problem is the evaluation because uh, since it's an online thing, uh, it's very very hard to evaluate something. I think most common. A metric that, that's used with topic models is the perplexity, but the latest research has shown that perplexity is probably not the best thing to do. So people are kind of like sticking to the, the hello likelihood. So these are the set of examples, topics that you can see here. And you can see the red ones are the negative ones, and the, uh, the green ones are the positive ones, kind of like orange. As you can see, there are a few uh, topics regarding ISIS and everything like that, the attacks in Iraq and uh, Syria and everything like that. Uh, but you can see there is a positive topic there, uh, which was about the oil uh, export, uh, export to Turkey. Uh, so these are kind of like a uh, few comparisons between the two. Uh, as you can see, since it's an online thing, it's much, much faster than the JST. And uh, the hello likelihood is pretty much close here. So there it was pretty much like. Uh, the online JST kind of like works much faster than JST, uh, but it's not as good as the JST because it's kind of like based on uh, sampling. So since it's online, it's much faster, which kind of like uh, does everything. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Shwanshu. I'm from uh, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I mean, kind of, I can continue from the last presentation. What we saw in the last presentation was like, you know, tweets being classified as either positive or negative. Uh, when we looked at the problem, we thought that, like, this is probably not one of the best ways of classifying tweets. As you can see, like, you know, these are some tweets which we collected on social causes. And if any organization is studying social causes, a positive or negative sentiment of a tweet will not be useful for them. So we decided to build something which will give them a more quantifiable measure, something like enthusiasm and support of the users, which we can eventually use in classifying the users. So we built a new classification scheme, which is basically a, a set of orthogonal classes, which uh, is like enthusiastic, passive, and supportive and non-supportive. So these will be two classifiers which will give a score to each of the tweet. And then we can use uh, these classifiers in uh, determining how a tweet is on the scale. So not only we decide to build the classifier, but we decide to build a whole model, which can help us in eventual user classification. So I mean, we started with a pretty basic study. We took three query terms, which is like concussion in NFL, cyberbullying, and LGBT as our query terms. Uh, we got these terms uh, hand-coded by uh, two individuals. Uh, so you can see like 1,500 queries were collected. And uh, there was a code book which was built which, uh, uh, in which uh, people had a set of rules for classifying each tweet along each of the classes. We use some of the features, apart from the word features like number of emoticons, number of URL, number of mentions in the classifier. Uh, as it like, came out that uh, people had more uh, uh, convergence when it came to enthusiasm and pass passiveness. So as you can see in these tweets, like, so the first tweet is enthusiastic supportive. It's, it's like something detailed about a topic, supporting the topic. Next one is passive supportive because like mostly it has a link. And it just says that like, it's just about a news article. The last one is non-supportive. It has a colon P in it. Uh, we decided to uh, test it on some like, new uh, test queries. So this, like, the first one is legalizing uh, prostitution. And uh, the next one is legalizing marijuana. Uh, we found that, again, like the enthusiastic passive classifier has worked well. Uh, the, again, the support, non-support is something which is like very context dependent. So we moved to the next part, where is, like, we actually classify the users and the entities in a tweet corpus. So we looked at like, the whole corpus and uh, gave scores to each of the users and entities with like, hashtags. So we see like, uh, Thomas4j is the like, most enthusiastic user. I'll, in the next slide, I'll show you like, what the properties of those users were. So I see like, the most uh, passive users are, like, are the supportive users. Uh, the passive users tend to have uh, oops, uh, tweets, which uh, like, uh, 
Yeah, passive users tend to be more retweeted, which mostly when looking at the tweets, we found them to be mostly news links. Enthusiastic users are like, you know, sending out a lot of tweets uh, with a lot of hashtag names, something which was discussed in the morning presentation about how spammers work. And uh, like, again, so most of the like passive users with a lot of tweets were supportive. We have built this whole functionality into a text analysis tool called Context, which you can uh, download from this link. And uh, this will basically help you like in querying using the Twitter API and getting the whole network data done. So that's uh, like one of the things uh, which we learned from the project is that like uh, sometimes positive is negative is not necessarily useful. And uh, we wanted to measure the level and support of enthusiasm uh, in a Twitter corpus, and that's what we have built now. So for more details, you can visit to this project. Thank you. Okay, this closes this session. I will be back here at uh, 4.30 sharp.